it is an absolute honor to have Bianca here today to share uh, some of her vast experience with these extremely interesting methods. Thank you again, Bianca, for joining us and contributing to this primary and provocation series. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. This has been, as we said earlier, it's been in the planning for a long time and it's a pleasure uh, to finally um, be with you with this. Although I've prepared many slides, you may be uh, worried by seeing the number at the bottom of the slides and that when, when I change from the title. The point is that I wish to be interrupted and I don't need to cover all the material that is there. I just want to give you some hints of my understanding of the topic, which is uh, on which I worked for a few years, but I, by no way I'm the greatest expert on it, but I had some experience. So I'll, I'll without further ado, as Dario said, let's start. So I'll start with the definition of what I think mediation analysis is. And my definition is that mediation concerns the extent to which the causal effect of one variable on another, on an outcome, is mediated by some intermediate variable or variables. And here I want to stress the word causal, because I don't think there would be any mediation analysis if we didn't think within a, a causal context. Let's consider this example here, uh, represented by a, a simple triangle of, media, of many mediation analysis. Here our exposure is maternal smoking, and the outcome is disruptive behavior, at, say at age seven uh, in the children, of, uh, of, this, uh, of the participants. We start with the assumption that there is a causal relationship between maternal smoking and disruptive behavior. And then with mediation analysis, we try to explain whether that causal relationship may be explained by some other intermediate variables. In this case, the birth weight of the child uh, uh, conceived and, uh, and developed in utero during while the mother was smoking. So the focus of mediation analysis is to in, interpret or offer some possible me, uh, in, mechanistic interpretation of the causal effect of one variable to the other. And the aim of mediation analysis is very often to separate the path that involves the mediator, in this case me, uh, birth weight, and the path that does not involve the mediator, which would rep be represented by this arrow, but it, although it's often referred by all of us, in fact, as a direct effect, that does not mean that it, there aren't other mediators in this path. So whenever we talk about direct effect, we really should say it's a direct effect in terms of the mediator we are studying. So it's direct in the sense that it does not involve birth weight, while the indirect uh, would involve birth weight. Now, there are two main strands of, for the study of mediation analysis and, and the topic of this uh, of this. Uh, workshop. And the two are path analysis, which is probably very well known by many of you, many of the, those working psycho, psycho, psychometrics, for sure. That has been around for more than a century, started by a publication of your right from the 1920s onwards, was made very uh, much accessible to research, applied research in psychometrics by a paper, very famous paper by Byron and Kenny, Kelly, sorry, 1984. And uh, later on was sort of uh, even more uh, made accessible by the, the development and the, uh, and the uh, book written by Bolin on structural equation models where path analysis was well, uh, it was clarified what path analysis, uh, in what ways path analysis belonged to SEMs. Then the other strand is what we, many of us refer to as counterfactual based causal inference. There are different ways of doing causal inference. This, the one I'm talking about is the one which is, belongs to the framework of counterfactual uh, inference. And, and I will explain what that means. But this is, comes from a more recent branch of the literature, which started in the 90s, really, with a paper by Robinson Greenland about natural direct and indirect effects, and then developed by Pearl and many others, and reviewed beautifully by in a book, quite a thick book by Tyler van der Veel in 2015. All the references are at the end. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about the two, the two approaches, and uh, I will probably spend more time in so dissecting why path analysis sometimes is not sufficient and what are the limitations of it. So the critique is an important aspect of my introduction. So please interrupt, especially if you disagree. And the second half is sort of a brief 
overview introduction to counterfactual mediation analysis, which is slightly technical, but I try to make it less technical, and then some summary and discussion. So as we said, path analysis is popular from the 1980s, thanks to uh, uh, Baron and Kenny. And uh, if you do a search, a literature search on path analysis, mediation analysis, um, uh, psychology, you'll find loads, loads of references. And I picked two in particular here to just to illustrate some of my points. There is sort of no direct criticism of these particular papers, but they're just used for illustration of what are the issues that you may want to raise when you read applications of mediation analysis based on path analysis. So let's think, start with the first one by Flowery et al. Um, which studied the relationship between adverse life events in early childhood and uh, internalizing symptoms in later childhood. Or, uh, in, in this particular diagram, you can say internalized symptoms at age 11, adverse life events up to age nine. And this study was based on the Alspach study, um, uh, which um, probably many of you know, but it concerns about 10,000 children fallen from their birth uh, which was around 1990s in the area of Bristol and the surrounding areas. The question they were asking is whether, well, they assumed, started with the assumption that adverse life events cumulatively in, in the early life would causally influence um, conduct problems later in childhood. And they considered possible pathways, um, in particular pathway that involves the inflammatory um, uh, inflammation. And they had two measures of inflammation recorded when the children were age nine, IL-6 and CRP. This diagram refers to IL-6, which, because preliminary analysis showed some, uh, some relationships um, of interest and they focus on that. So this is what they analyzed. They studied adverse life events, which is uh, an, an exposure it's a count, number of life events up to age nine. Internalizing symptoms is measured by the score, um, and the, the standard scores, which is, is a sum of, of several items. While IL-6 was measured um, as a biological mark and it's a continuous variable. And this diagram shows many of the confounders they're considered. Surprisingly, they, Maybe it was a mistake, maybe it's for discussion. Yeah. So they, they did not have an arrow, for example, from sex and ethnicity in influencing adverse life events, which probably they did assume in their analysis, but it's not in their diagram. But beside that, what they report is these results. They, re they report a separation of the total causal effect of adverse life events on internalizing symptoms as with an estimate of 0.14, which is highly significant. And that will represent the change in symptoms uh, per one unit increase in adverse life effect. And then they separate into this direct and indirect effect, where the direct is the one that does not influence IL-6, and the indirect is the one that goes through IL-6. And they find a significant, borderline significant pathway involving IL-6. And that was their conclusion, that there was some evidence of um, a you know, um, inflammation pathway for this uh, relationship. Now, how did they estimate these measures? And this is, I'm going to be a little bit technical and please ask me questions if things are not clear. So I'm, I just redraw their diagrams with letters instead of name of variables, where with X, I represent the exposure, in that case, um, accumulative life events in childhood. Y is the disruptive behavior indicator and M is IL-6, the inflammatory marker, and C are the confounders, which probably would um, influence both M and X as well as Y. So they, they got those estimates by fitting two regression models. The first was a model for the outcome, Y, for um, disruptive the, the, the score of disruptive behavior. And they, it's a continuous variable, so they have regression coefficients, which are called here, here, beta M and beta X represent the regression coefficient for mediator and exposure and a generic beta C to represent a vector of regression coefficients for the confounders. And then they're hi highlighted here is beta X, which is what in path analysis is called the direct effect because it represents the effect of X on Y 
as you can see, which is not mediated by M because uh, the, the path through M is sort of blocked by conditioning on M. We also fit a second regression model. This time is the model for the mediator. And here the regression coefficients are represented by alphas. So we have alpha X is the um, regression coefficient for IL-6 as a function of um, cumulative uh, adverse life events. And alpha C is the coefficient for the confounder. And what in path analysis you do, uh, once you fit these two models, is to multiply alpha x by beta m to capture what is the in, they call the indirect effect. So they say if we're unit change in x, there will be alpha x changes in m as a consequence of this in expectations. And when you have alpha x times m changes in, in m, you will have an impact on y, which is measured by beta m. So the indirect effect becomes alpha. A unit change in x will lead to an alpha x time beta m changes in y. And that's the indirect effect. And the estimation of the standard error is usually carried out using bootstrap. So that's as simple as that. And uh, it's easily uh, easy to use software, path analysis software, or do it yourself and do your calculations yourself. No, no difficulties there. So let's consider what assumptions we are making by doing these calculations or what the authors have made um, in, in delivering these estimates. The first strong assumption is that all relationships are linear. And the second is that there is no additional confounding at play uh, when they estimated these regression coefficients that then are then interpreted as direct and indirect. So let me examine each of these assumptions more carefully. So the reliance on linearity. So let's imagine that, so at the moment we have a model where we have simply uh, IL-6 and uh, adverse life events in our model, which are both continuous variables, and we are just entering them as they are. We are not assuming that the two may interact. It could be that IL-6, the effect of IL-6 changes depending on how many uh, early life events you have, or vice versa, that the, the association of early life events with the uh, disruptive behavior is modified by um, your natural level maybe of IL-6. So we have assumed no interaction between them as well as no interaction between them and the confounders, which are also included in the model. The other assumption we are making is that these continuous variables of number of life events and IL-6 both have linear relationships with the outcome, um, which is disruptive behavior score. And this again may be inappropriate because there could be a, you know, an increased effect. The, 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 the more early adverse life events you have, the stronger maybe is the impact on the outcome. And the same about IL-6 or, vice, or, or, or the smaller, who knows? But if this was the case, the model on which all these calculations are based would be misspecified. So we would use biased estimates of these relationships to derive direct and indirect effects. If we were worried about it, maybe we can test whether those interactions are there or nonlinearities are there, we may end up with a model that includes them. So now I'm just looking at the example where we say that there is actually an interaction between uh, adverse life events and IL-6. So we include an interaction between X and M and we'll have a new parameter here, beta XM. So now we are left with saying, how do we calculate? What is the direct effect? Is it beta x, which was our original, you know, the regression parameter for x was our direct effect? How do we include the impact of this interaction? Do we give, we could give separate estimates from each level of the mediator, but this is not usually done. And the authors have not really discussed this. So this is my first comment about the assumption of linearity. Well, let's just, maybe I've already implied this. So, we have, we have already, you know, I think I've already said the implications specifically for this paper is that we have this strong assumption of no interaction and no uh, departure from linearity in all the relationships. But let's consider the second assumption, because assumption that's made, and it's that we have dealt with all the potential confounders, because as we know, if there are spurious, there could be spurious association due to unmeasured confounding or an accounting confounding. But let's even assume that they have all the, if I go back to the slides with their confounders. 
in the second up here, they have gender ethnicity. This is depression score for maternal depression score at 32 weeks, socioeconomic status at 32 weeks, and then BMI of the child uh, at age nine. So let's say that these are really, even if there was an arrow here, which probably could, there could be for gender and ethnicity and socioeconomic status, even if, if they, they, they were all included, there is another small problem. And that's what I'm going to discuss. So let's even if we are happy to say we have dealt with all the confounders, there is one particular confounder they've used, which raised some concerns, raises some concerns. So there's that confounder was BMI of the child at age nine. So they control for it because they think it may influence IL-6, it may influence the behavior at age 11. But what if, so by just controlling for it as it is, the underlying implicit assumption is that adverse life effects events does not influence BMI and I at all. And that could be you know, a defensible assumption or not, but I'm just raising the point that maybe there are some of the confounders considered for the mediator outcome relationship that um, may actually not be simple confounders, but intermediate confounders, because they may be, um, they may be downstream from uh, the exposure. So this is another implicit assumption, we're just going back. So that, that's what uh, this slide says. So the, there could be complications if, this, if there was an arrow between here and not allowing for the arrow is an implication, is an assumption which is implied. But let's see what consequences there are if the arrow were there, but we are not modeled it or accounted for it. So what happens? So at the moment, the model the model for the outcome controls for BMI. And we derive, even if there were no interaction or nonlinearity, we say the coefficient for ALE, adverse life events, captures the direct effect. However, by controlling, as if my dynamics works, by controlling for that confounder, we're actually blocking some of the direct effect of ALE, because the definition of direct effect is any causal path that does not involve the mediator. So the path involving BMI and 9 and not IL-6 is part of the direct effect. So this path here should be added to this to make into the direct effect. But because we have control for BMI and 6 to deal with the confounding of this arrow here, we have removed some of the direct effect. So we get an estimate, a bias estimate of the direct effect because we have removed some of the direct effect. On the other hand, if we decide that that's a problem and we do not control for BMI and 9 because we want to have a, an unbiased estimate of the direct effect, what we get is a biased estimate of this arrow because there will be a spurious association induced by the um, impact of BMI. So either way, whether we control for a, a variable which is an intermediate confounder, in the sense it's a confounder, of the mediator outcome relationship, but it's downstream from the exposure, adverse life events, we, we, are, we are damned because we, um, either way, we get either a biased estimate of the component of the indirect effect or a biased estimate of the direct effect. And, and obviously either way, we, we get something wrong. So, this was one example, and I'll try to illustrate. I don't, uh, uh, Dari, interrupt me, if the, please, if there are questions or things that need to clarify. No questions so far. Okay, uh, thank yeah. you. So now I'll move on to the other example. I, I, and I should stress, I don't want to, so it's not a criticism of the paper, but it's a criticism of the area which uh, applies these methods without explicitly um, listing all the assumptions that are uh, that are made implicitly. But now look at the other paper, the Martinez one, and and this has sort of a couple of points I want I want to raise about this paper. In that paper, um, data from a, a randomized trial uh, were, were reanalyzed to understand mechanisms. So the original trial was randomized treatment um, uh, for. Um, again, a disruptive behavior in children, but the treatment was interested in whether, sorry, the randomized trial was interested in comparing two possible treatment types, a modular treatment versus a usual, usual, usual care 
onto whether parents were involved or not. And uh, the, the trial found a significant association between, or an every significant effect of treatment onto parental involvement. But then the paper here examines whether which pathway that, um, that mechanism may, may involve. And a, a, a composite indicator of the, how the, um, uh, the, the, the person giving the treatment, the, the, uh, the counselor uh, was delivering the treatment, was measured by some psychoeducation composites. Don't, uh, don't ask me more details. I can, uh, the, the paper is, is, uh, can be shared later. But this, this is a composite of various questions that were asked about how the treatment was uh, delivered. And this is, this is okay, so they find that there is some indirect effect, quite marginal, involving this, uh, this composite of psychoeducation. But the paper goes beyond that and tries to understand which aspect of this psychoeducational involvement um, worked. And they, they draw this diagram. And you can see there are several uh, components of that composite, and it was to do with whether or not the... the um, the counselor was describing the child problem to the parents, whether they were discussing his behavior, etc. So each first, so there are a few things I want to say about this. And then path analysis was used, and you, you can see here the regression, linear regression coefficients attached to each line. So my first comment is that these are all binary variables, and they were fitted using that the regression model was fitted using linear regression, which is can be inappropriate depending on how prevalent the um, each outcome is and depending on how many confounders you may have. So they, uh, we usually use logistic regression for binary outcome for a reason. But the second most important criticism is that the, this diagram shows that the assumption is made that each pathway is separate. So there is, there is no association between whether describing the child problem helped discussing the causes of maybe his behavior or whether describing the goal of treatment maybe influenced how the uh, treatment rationale was the end. So did, all these estimates assume that these are completely independent paths. And this is hard to justify in this case, I think, but in, in many other cases when you want to study multiple mediators. So just a flag to say, if your interest in mediation analysis involves multiple mediators, assuming independent pathways may be quite uh, unrealistic and inappropriate. And, uh, and this is sort of another concern with how sort of path analysis is often applied. Because of course you could add more arrows here and uh, association, but that will cause some other difficulties that we could discuss maybe at the end. I have also one additional point, but maybe I'll skip this because I think time is going and I'll leave it for you to read it. It's, it's to do with the fact that everything is very fuzzy without going through the details. It's, it's definitions are fuzzy. You start with regression models and then you interpret beta X as direct effect and alpha X beta M as indirect effect, but it's all, it's not really justified from first principles. And that's where I think the other approach to mediation analysis come, come with come, uh, yeah, come with. But uh, first, a quick summary so that we don't lose anyone. So what I'm trying to say in, the, in this first 25 minutes is that traditional approach to mediation analysis suffer from important limitations. Models are restricted to be linear. It's unclear how intermediate confounders like BMI and nine can be dealt with. And the derivation of these effects is very informal. And Contribution for the causal inference literature instead have, have generalized this approach by making it more formal and have also highlighted the need to be very careful about confounding. Not that they've solved all the problem, not that they don't make assumptions, but at least the assumptions are explicit. So now I move on to describing the counterfactual approach to mediation analysis. And I go back to the original example where we had maternal smoking assumed to be causally related to disruptive, with disruptive behavior and birth weight as a potential mechanism for that association. And the questions, there are many questions we went on to ask. So just to get sort of slightly deeper in what do we want from mediation analysis, I've dotted here a few questions that we may not want to ask. And then 
from the question decide what we want to estimate instead of saying this is a mediator, this is an outcome, this is an exposure, this is a regression model, and I've derived my parameter. So let's say, what is the question? The question of what could be what is the contribution of birth weight to the effect of maternal smoking on disruptive behavior? Or it could be what would be the effect if maternal smoking left each child's birth weight unchanged, which would be the same as what would be the effect if you could remove this arrow? So the first question is, is sort of a, a question of percentage contribution. You could say how what percentage of the, of the causal association is due to birth weight? 20%, you could say. That would be what you are try to answer here. And here instead we'll, we'll say, what is remaining? If you could do something like take a, a tablet that removes the, the effect of maternal smoking on reducing birth weight. What, what would you be left with? Or another question, which is, seems ri ridiculous here, but one would also ask, what would be effect if we could fix every child to have the same birth weight? So I, I think this is an example of, of a measure that when the mediator is binary, then say, uh, um, vaccination, what would happen if you could vaccinate everyone that would make more sense but, or would not vaccinate anyone, etc. You could ask many questions and because there are so many questions you could ask, the counterfactual based approach tries to reflect the question without recalling, recalling to a model. And so these questions are translated into causal contrast from first principles that in this literature refer to estimates. And these are defined without involving any regression model. And many have been proposed in the literature. Here there is sort of a, a long list of direct effect and indirect effects that all have slightly different uh, focus, focuses, depending on, on what question they're trying to address. And there are more, many, but there are others since, since uh, I prepared this slide. But the, the important point is that it's the question that drives your choice of estimate. It's not the model that, you, that, um, that guides you, uh, your parameter choice. And what I'm going to discuss now, um, or describe, uh, are what are sort of the, the, the ones which are more commonly referred to, but have limitation, because I'm we're going to criticize them as well, which are the natural direct and indirect effect. If there is time, I'll give a quick hint on control direct effect. And again, if there is time, I'll just give you a view of the randomized intervention analogs of the natural effects. And if I don't have time, you can see that it, it, I think they're quite clearly described in the slides, clearly, I say. Anyway, before, so because, because we don't start from a model, but we start from first principle, and because this is a counterfactual based approach to mediation analysis, I now need to spend a little bit, a few minutes to, to define what are the counterfactuals. So what, what is the thinking process we make when we adopt this approach? Well, we try to think of scenarios, alternative scenarios under different settings for mediators and exposures. And we use this notation. So we call capital Y little bracket little x the value of the outcome that the value that the outcome would take in say uh, disruptive behavior, if we could change X, intervene on X, in, uh, which is maternal smoking in my example, and set it to be the same value for everyone. So I, I could imagine a world where all, where all mothers smoke during pregnancy, or I could imagine the world where all mothers, none of the mothers smoke during pregnancy. And this will give me a sense of what Y1 and Y0 is. Y1 would be the potential outcome, the poten what would have happened to that uh, disruptive behavior of the child had the mother smoked, and Y0 would be what would have happened had the mother not smoked. And we leave everything else as it is, so all the other factors are not touched. We only touch, they may influence Y. We only in uh, intervene on X. And we could think, because we are in the mediation context, we could think the same process for the mediator. So just focusing on the left-hand side of the triangle, MX is the potential mediator, had we intervened on X. And again, the complications of mediation analysis makes us also think, what would have happened to Y, disruptive behavior, if we could intervene on maternal smoking and also intervene on uh, birth weight in some way? 
and that will be represented by y bracket little x little m where we choose what x is and we choose what m is and we think of this world so we have a lot of imagination in this uh, in this context so having these concepts help us define without according to a model what direct and indirect effects are and to define the questions um, accordingly so just one more formality and then I'll go into drawings. Just thinking of the total causal effect, it, it, forget for a moment mediation analysis. So with this in principle definition of what a total causal effect could be, would be a comparison of averages in my population. So E stands for expectation or mean over all the Y ones, all the, disruptive behavior when all mothers smoke, I take the average of those disruptive behavior indicators, scores, and I take the average of all the potential outcomes, the potential disruptive behavior scores of the children had none of the mothers smoked. And this contrast, this difference, is what we call the total causal effect. And as you see, there are no models there. It's just thinking a world with and a world without the exposure status. But now, because we are moving on to more difficult world of mediation analysis, I just want to stress that this the, uh, contrast could also be written by including the value of the mediator in, within brackets. Because we could say, if we set X to be one or mothers to be smoking, obviously the mediator, the birth weight, will have a value, which is M1. It's the value of birth weight that would have occurred had the mother smoked. And M0 is the value of the birth weight had the mother not smoked. So we can insert this and say that the total causal effect is a contrast where we set the exposure to be one and we set the mediator to take the value that birth weight would have taken had the mother smoked in this world where mothers smoke and the same here. I don't see any question arising, so I'll go to a drawing and maybe this will help this. So this is what we're our counterfactual thinking comes in. So we have only one baby, obviously, and then we take the average of all the babies, but we consider this baby to live through two possible worlds. In the first world, X, the exposure is set to non-smoking, and the birth weight of that baby will turn out to be M0, so the birth weight it would have occurred in the absence of smoking. And the potential outcome in the absence of smoking and when the birth weight takes the value in the absence of smoking becomes Y0 and zero. I do the same exercise here. I set X to be on, the mother smokes, the birth weight will be the birth weight of that baby under the exposure status, under smoking status of the mother during pregnancy. And the potential outcome will be Y1 and one. Now, the total causal effect is a comparison of the averages of these potential outcomes. Now, you can see how I can, following this drawing, now I can try to conceptualize the difference in terms of natural direct and indirect effect. Because now, let's think of the natural, I will explain why it's natural in a moment, but now think of a direct effect where we want to isolate the impact of smoking that does not involve the mediator. So we still have the same reference population here where there is no smoking, but then we wanted to compare to a world where there is no impact of smoking. There is no smoking influencing the birth weight of the baby. So we, have, we remove the impact, we, we set the mediator to take the birth weight, to take the value, had the mother not smoke, while she is still smoking. So that we still want the effect of smoking, but it not, does not involve the mediator. So our direct effect is a comparison of, of averages or potential outcomes where of Y0 M0, no exposure whatsoever, versus Y1 M0. So the mediator is the same in the two worlds, but the exposure status is switched on and off here. You can see where I'm going with the indirect effect. Now with the indirect effect, what we do is to only modify the impact of smoking that influences, that works through the mediator. So now we have M0 and M1 here, because we have sort of removed, we, we, still, have, we, we still have the mother smoking in both worlds, but we switch on and off the mediator. 
and this is y1 and 0 and y1 and 1. You may wonder why I we could have the same definition of indirect effect if we put non-smoking here and non-smoking here and it would be y0 and 0 and y0 and 1. But the important thing is that we hold the level of the exposure to be the same so that there will be no impact of that, but we switch on and off the exposure, the exposure's impact on the mediator. I don't see any question, but maybe Camille has a question, but I can't hear you. No, <laughs> okay. I think they're just trying, yeah. Okay. So, so why are they, so this is the formal definition, but I think you don't want to see it. But the important thing is to notice is that this decompose, these two definitions end up summing to each other into the total causal effect. So by estimating this natural direct and indirect effect from first, by, by defining, I'm still defining things, by defining natural direct, indirect and indirect effect from first principles, I can um, define, for example, something I want to know, which is the percentage mediated because the two together gives me the total. So the ratio, for example, the natural indirect over the total will give me the percentage mediated. Beautiful. I haven't called upon uh, any models. I haven't said how I'm going to estimate them though. And that's where the problem comes. Um, it's difficult. It, estimating this quantity and first of all, identifying as we say in, in this literature requires very strong assumptions. And then I'm going to discuss this and then maybe we'll open up uh, the, the floor. So very briefly, now you, this is a slightly messy drawing, but you recognize your X, your M, and the Y and the C. What we're assuming at, that C does the job properly and there are no residual confounders or unmeasured confounders between M and Y, which is this cross here, between X and Y and between X and M. So we, we, we make the same assumption as in path analysis. There is no um, unmeasured confounding in any of the relationships for this model. But we need to, to be able to identify from first principle this natural effect. We need another assumption. We need the assumption that there is no intermediate confounding. Do you remember I earlier pointed out that there is a problem if BMI at age nine is downstream from uh, adverse life events? And one, one assumption that would allow us to identify this natural effect is to uh, assume that there are no intermediate effects. We may measure them, but we cannot identify the natural um, direct or indirect effect if there are intermediate confounders. And there is a slide in the, uh, at the appendix of this pack, which explains why um, this is a required assumption. But I, I, I move on to, to, to continue the story. So, and the story continues to say, well, okay, so there are situations where we can't identify these natural effects. And, and in fact, that's what also applies to path analysis. If we realize we got bias estimate, whatever way uh, we deal with that confounders. But that's where the new possible counterfactual based con contrast come from. So I'm, I will only describe a simple one and then the more complicated one, which is probably the one I prefer, but I pre first I'll go for the simpler one. So what are alternative estimates? So just to summarize, these natural effects allow us to answer the first question I posed, which was when I had my very first reminder of the question, which is here. So it would uh, estimating natural direct and indirect effect would allow us to, to re answer this question, what's the contribution of birth weight? To the effect on maternal smoke, and we could say it's 20% with this confidence interval. Um, what I'm, the control direct effect I'm going to describe now is going to answer this question What would the effect of B of birth weight if birth weight was fixed at a fixed value? And you see already this doesn't really help us for this example because we can't really. Let me just go. What the control direct effect does is to say, let's fix the mediator to a given value, let's say three kilo point two, which is the average in, in the population of children in Alsbach, and see what is the effect of switching on and off zero one 
um, the exposure while fixing the mediator at a given value. This doesn't make sense for birth weight as a mediator, but as I said earlier, it could make sense if the mediator was vaccination, because you can say what would happen, what is the effect of the exposure on the outcome if we could have everybody vaccinated or everybody not vaccinated, which would be fixing the value of little m, the value of the mediator. And the formal definition is here and um, details are there. What assumptions do we make to estimate the control direct effect? There are much fewer. We only need no measure confounding for the x to y relationship and the m to y relationship. So that's quite neat. Uh, we can have any interactions, any nonlinearities, as we'll see in the last slide when I talk about estimation, to estimate these effects. But the control direct effect for my particular example is not really suitable, doesn't really answer the question of interest. Note also that you, you are allowed to have intermediate uh, confounders here when you, when you focus your question on the control direct effect. But what if your mediator, mediator is continuous? Well, there is another another uh, bunch of causal contrast, which have a funny name of randomized interventional analogs of natural direct and indirect effect. And these are the ones that I think are more prominently used in the last few years, and I've used them too. They do not require the assumption of no intermediate confounders. So we, we are sort of relaxing that strong assumption and we can deal with intermediate BMI uh, at age nine if we focus on these um, on these estimates. But what do they ask? Apologies for the heavy notation, but I'll try to uh, point out what the difference, for example, from before it was. Before, when, with a natural direct effect, we had the exposure switched on and off and the mediator set at a value they would have taken under no exposure, like the birth weight when the mother does not smoke, does not smoke, was here and here. And for the indirect effect, we had the same level of the X, but we had the birth weight of the child had the mother smoked and the birth weight of the child had the mother not smoked. So it's very similar definition, but instead of saying, putting here the potential mediators of, um, and the different exposure status, we take a random draw from the distribution of birth weights when the mothers do not smoke and a random draw of the distribution when the mother smokes. So we just imagine um, a world where you could switch, switch, uh, uh, swish, no, push the distribution of birth weight to behave or to, to, to redefine the distribution of the mediator to, to replicate what is seen in the data when there is exposure or not exposure status. So it's all formalized here. You just take a random and this, so this, this is like the, these two blue and red line are the distribution of birth weight of mothers who don't smoke for given other levels of confounders. You have to do it stratified by confounder status. And this is the distribution of birth weight when of those whose mother smoked. And what you do by calculating this, you, you, take a, uh, you do a simulation where you randomly draw the values here from the blue distribution, you randomly draw uh, a value here from the red distribution, and then you calculate the average uh, over this. And this really addresses the question, what is the impact of shifting the distribution of the mediator according to different levels of exposures? And final two slides. Um, estimating this quantity involves, yes, fitting regression models, but they are used with the purpose of identifying these potential outcomes. So we are, we, we can, we are very free. We can use inter, interaction, nonlinearities, anything. But all we do is to try to predict those potential outcomes of my little drawings with the baby birth weight and the, and the outcome. Fitting them in uh, state and R is, is accessible. I'm not saying it's easy, but there are many commands available for, for this approach. Um, just a minor point that if your model is simple, if you don't have intermediate confounders, if you don't have 
if everything is continuous and there are no linearities, no interaction, you get exactly the same results, the same estimates as the direct and indirect effect of path analysis. And this is a plus, it's not a minus. It's simply saying we could justify path analysis in terms of a formal definition of direct and indirect effect, as opposed to informal as it was up to now. So summary, the traditional approach to mediation analysis suffers from severe, not severe, several limitation. Invoking the concept of potential outcome, we can define mediation effects that make sense intuitively and that are independent of any statistical models. And uh, this should be plural, sorry, um, but that's an important point. You're not restricted by the model. And there are many definitions, I've hinted at a few. The interventional effects are probably difficult to conceptualize, especially if it's the first time you see them, but they do answer a question of what would have happened if you could intervene, for example, and change the behavior of mothers in their smoking and see if the, the birth weight of the children could follow that intervention. And, and you can ask sort of refined questions, but you cannot, what I forgot to say, you cannot then from those randomized um, analogs you cannot calculate the percentage mediated, unfortunately. So you're free, you're free from the strong assumption of no intermediate confounders, but you cannot answer the question what percentage is mediated. But you can still say how much of the, how large is the indirect effect if you could shift the distribution. And what I haven't touched is multiple mediators. It's a problem related to intermediate confounders. There are several solutions exactly, again, depending on which question you ask and what assumptions you're prepared to make. But it's a, it's a difficult world, but it's a very interesting world. But it is, I think the final message is this is not easy, uh, but we need to be explicit in our assumption. We need to be also explicit in our questions, first of all. This brings me to the end, and here are some references and uh, there are these additional slides of why not Noel. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Bianca. Thank you so much. I think it was illuminating. Um, we open the floor for any questions that you may have. Please feel free to raise your hands. I'll probably start myself. Maybe one question here is uh, when, when we apply um, structural equation models, um, which is uh, yeah, more general approach than, than math analysis, we have the flexibility to have um, variables that are sort of free of measurement errors uh, because we are analyzing them sort of in a in a latent world right yes. and my question is is there any way to account for that within this framework of the potential outcomes uh, approach that's an, ex an excellent question and in, in this something we try to work on and, and there are some publications out there it's including latent variables in the mediation triangle is quite problematic, but it obviously uh, it's problematic if you want to think of a potential outcome framework, because we are already imagining worlds where we intervene, where the mediator takes a particular value. Now we are thinking of what would happen to that medi latent, latent mediator, because so I think it's, it, it requires thinking, but it's doable, and some people have attempted it, but um, it's it's not straightforward. Okay, thank you really for for joining us. Okay. I, I we are running out of time then for for more questions. So um, really has been enlightening. Thank you very much.